Now, this is the continuation of, of our first lecture on dengue illness in which we describe the clinical presentation, the different clinical features, the differential diagnosis and what is the uh, investigation plan for making a diagnosis of uh, dengue illness. Now, in this presentation, we are going to discuss what are the treatment uh, plans for the patient who present with uh, dengue illness. You see, dengue illness has three phases. It's the febrile phase, the critical phase, and the convalescent phase. The treatment is different in uh, these three phases. And we see what treatment we offer in febrile phase. It is generally symptomatic. Patient does not require any other treatment than just symptomatic treatment. For example, if the patient has body pains and fever, paracetamol can be used. Try to avoid non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs because they interfere with platelet uh, function and they can uh, result in bleeding, which is one of the complications of dengue fever. So what we use is uh, paracetamol and we can use other uh, methods of uh, controlling temperature. For example, we can use sponging, etc. and keep the patient well hydrated. If the hydration is uh, compromised, the patient may have more problems in the uh, critical phase. But keep in mind, when the patient comes to you, you have to have an idea what amount of fluid the patient has already taken because during the calculation of the fluid quota for that patient we have to have in mind that what sort of fluid the patient has already been given and then if the patient has nausea vomiting we can use drugs which can control nausea and vomiting so this is generally in the febrile phase the treatment is only symptomatic and keep the patient hydrated and just keep on monitoring to look for the development of the critical phase and then the critical phase what is actually a critical phase the critical phase is a serious uh, stage in the development of or in the progress of uh, the dengue illness it requires very stringent clinical monitoring patients have certain clinical features like you have to monitor the pulse the blood pressure the pulse pressure the urine output the oxygen saturation and the capillary refill time and you see you monitor the hematocrit and the WPCs and any other test which may be required according to patient's clinical situation. Then you have to go for appropriate fluid replacement. So you require monitoring and fluid replacement. We will see uh, in the next slides uh, how we proceed in this case. You see the treatment in the critical phase, we have certain clinical features which should tell us that the patient has started developing a critical phase and well uh, all the treating physicians who are dealing with the dengue patients they should be aware of these uh, clinical features for example in the leak phase the patient starts developing abdominal pain there is persistent vomiting there is nausea there is loss of appetite and patient has restlessness there may be altered consciousness the fluid starts leaking and starts accumulating in the pleura and the peritoneum and patient may have mucosal bleed or there may be tender hepatomegaly. The tender hepatomegaly is one very serious clinical sign which suggests uh, the patient has uh, performed a uh, very serious type of decompensation or decompensated shock. And then patient has convalescent phase in which the patient starts feeling very well, the appetite improves, the GI symptoms they start disappearing there is hemodynamic improvement the urine output starts improving and you see a uh, rash may appear in this phase now the leak phase monitoring the monitoring actually depends upon the severity of the leak phase how severe it may be hourly monitoring in uh, compensated shock but in decompensated shock or profound shock you may require monitoring every 15 minutes so this uh, you have to decide clinically the patient is having compensated shock or patient has decompensated shock. In compensated shock, you can go for an hourly monitoring and in a decompensated shock, you have to monitor every 15 uh, minutes. And then you see in the leak phase, what we see, the patient develops tachycardia. There is narrow pulse pressure and there is low blood pressure. The patient has tachypnea. So there's tachycardia. There is hypotension, there is low pulse pressure, and there is tachypnea. Patient has increased capillary refill time. When you press the capillary bed, it immediately becomes pink, pink in normal people. But you see this capillary refill, which can be checked in the finger pulps or the pulps of the toe or the nail of the toes, it is increased. The extremities are 
cold. Patient has diminished urine output and the hematocrit starts rising. The patient may have low albumin or low cholesterol because that leaks from the circulation and the patient may have accumulation of fluid in the pleura or the peritoneum. And when there is convalescence, this fluid starts reabsorbing. During the late uh, critical phase, it starts reabsorbing. When it starts reabsorbing, the perfusion starts improving. The patient has settling blood pressure, the heart rate settles, the pulse pressure becomes normal, the respiration becomes normal, the capillary refill time becomes normal, the extremities are now warm, the patient has improving urine output and the hematocrit starts falling and the patient has abdominal or peritoneal fluid which starts disappearing now. And a third problem in patients who've got critical phase is that they may have internal bleeding which may not be visible. And it's the clinical monitoring which tells us that the patient has internal bleeding. So the patient has tachycardia, there is hypotension, there is narrow pulse pressure, there is tachypnea. You see, the capillary refill time is increased and the extremities, they become cold. There is diminishing urine output. Now, you see, this is very similar to what we see in the leak phase, that there is tachycardia, there is hypotension, narrow pulse pressure, there is tachypnea, there is increased capillary refill, decreased urine output. So all this is seen in the critical phase leak as well. Now, how to differentiate between these two? Here comes our hematocrit, which is important. In the leak phase, the hematocrit starts rising, while in the bleeding, the hematocrit starts falling. That's why monitoring the hematocrit is very important. It gives us very valuable information. If with the patients having signs of uh, low perfusion and the hematocrit is falling, this patient is bleeding. If it is more than 10 point drop in the hematocrit from the baseline, that means the patient is bleeding. And you see the other difference is patients who are leaking, they have collection of the fluid in the pleura and peritoneum while the patients who are bleeding they don't have uh, the fluid in the pleura and the peritoneum but you see patients who are in the leak phase at the same time they can bleed as well so that may not be helping us to differentiate but the hematocrit is very useful in differentiating what is going on now in the critical phase we calculate the fluid quota for a fluid quota, we take the ceiling weight as 50 kilograms. Any patient who is more than 50 kilogram is considered as having only 50 kilogram as far as the fluid quota is concerned and the weight above the 50 kilogram is not included in calculating the fluid quota of the patient. The fluid quota is actually the maintenance fluid and the fluid deficit which is a total of 4600 milliliter. How we calculated it for maintenance fluid for every first 10 kilograms we take 100 ml per kg that is this is 1000 ml for the second 10 kilograms we take 50 milliliter per kg that means this is 500 milliliters and anything above that we calculate as 20 milliliter per kg that comes out to be maximum of uh, 600 milliliters and a fluid deficit which is 2500 milliliters so total turns out to be uh, 4600 milliliters for a fluid quota for a patient who is uh, 50 kilogram or above this is 4600 ml and for any person who is below 50 kilograms we can calculate from the uh, formula i have already given you so anybody who is more than 50 kilograms the total fluid quota is 4600 ml for anybody less than that we can calculate according to the weight of the patient now the fluid management before we go to the fluid management we have to see the patient is in compensated shock in decompensated shock or patient has profound shock now what is a shock the patient has signs of plasma leak like patient has restlessness there is increased thirst there is tachycardia cold clammy skin and the capillary refill time is more than two seconds so this patient is in shock if the patient has additional feature like if the pulse pressure is between 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury or the urine output is maintained between 25 to 30 milliliters per hour this patient is having compensated shock but if the pulse pressure is 20 millimeters or low and the urine output is less than 
25 milliliters per hour this patient is having decompensated shock and if the patient is pulseless this means the patient has profound shock so it is on the pulse pressure and the urine output we decide this is a compensated shock or it's a decompensated shock or patient is having profound shock if the patient has a pulse pressure between 20 to 30 millimeters this is a compensated shock along with it a urine output per hour of 25 to 30 milliliters and if the pulse pressure is less than 20 and the patient has diminished urine output less than 25 milliliters per hour this is a decompensated shock and if the patient is pulseless this patient has a profound shock so we go for baseline testing like CBC, the hematocrit, the uh, arterial blood gases, the renal function test, the electrolytes, the liver function test, the uh, blood sugar, we go for blood grouping and cross matching. So we do all these tests when the patient has come with uh, clinical features of shock, it is compensated or decompensated, whatever. You see, we give a patient 1000 ml bolus of normal saline as quickly as possible in uh, decompensated shock in compensated shock we give it over a period of two hours if the patient has decompensated shock or a profound shock we give it as quickly as we can and you see if there is any improvement if the patient shows signs of improvement we monitor the urine output is started becoming normal we see the hematocrit every four to six hours and we look for the some signs of improvement we can now think about the fluid what to do we can continue the fluid from 1.5 milliliter per kg to 10 milliliter per kg per hour to um, maintain the circulatory volume and if the patient shows clinical improvement and then we can think of stopping stopping the fluid in 48 hours period of time so this is how we see if patient comes with shock and you see you give 1000 ml of saline as a bolus in compensated shock in two hours in decompensated shock or pulseless patient or profound shock you give it as rapidly as possible and see for the presence of sign of improvement and if there is improvement then you keep on monitoring the patient for the next 48 hours and depending upon the clinical situation you can decide about stopping the fluid but you see if the patient shows no signs of improvement you repeat the hematocrit what has happened to the hematocrit if the hematocrit is increased it remains at the same level or it has dropped but not less than 10 points from the baseline you give another 500 ml of uh, normal saline in one hour or if the patient is in profound shock you can give it as quickly as possible and if there is any improvement then you monitor the urine output and the other parameters like you uh, monitor the hematocrit four to six hours you just keep on uh, looking for the signs of improvement and continue maintenance fluid and monitor patient for 48 hours and depending upon the clinical situation you can stop fluid so this is one way if the patient uh, shows signs of improvement you keep on monitoring and if the patient does not show any sign of improvement after you've given 500 ml of normal saline, you go for hematocrit again and you see what happens to the hematocrit. You see hematocrit has increased from the last time. What was you doing? The patient has uh, increased hematocrit. Then you see you give 10 to 20 milliliters of colloid solution for one to two hours. If the hematocrit has increased from the last reading you go for now a colloid fluid replacement the first we give 1000 ml of normal saline patient responded well and good if the patient has not responded we see the hematocrit if the hematocrit is stable or increasing or has not dropped too much we go for 500 ml of normal saline and see if the patient responds it's okay just keep on monitoring and if the patient is not responding after 500 ml of normal saline we go for hematocrit again if the hematocrit is stable and it's not falling very much we go for a colloid infusion now we go for a dextron so we give 10 to 20 milliliters per kg of colloid in one to two hours see if there is any sign of improvement if there is improvement again we just keep on monitoring the patient we see the urine output the signs of improvement that is perfusion pressure starts improving patient starts feeling well the blood pressure is stabilized 
you see and then uh, you continue the monitoring for uh, of hematocrit for four to six hour and a maintenance fluid of 1.5 to 10 milliliter per kg depending upon patient's requirement uh, to maintain a steady urine output and uh, acceptable blood pressure and a pulse pressure and then depending upon the patient's situation you can stop the fluid after 48 hours and then you see there is another situation you got patient who is presented with shock you go for the baseline testing and you are given the fluid challenge and then patient shows no signs of improvement you do a hematocrit you see in the first algorithm we saw the hematocrit remains stable or it becomes higher and higher or does not fall too much and the second situation is that you have gone given fluid you repeat the hematocrit the hematocrit has fallen more than 10 points from the baseline for this patient you have to transfuse cross matched blood you see in the first situation the hematocrit was stable or increased but and did not fall very much you start replacing fluid that means the patient was having hemo concentration and you start giving fluid but if you give 1000 ml and you repeat the hematocrit the hematocrit instead of improving or increasing it starts falling and if it has fallen more than 10 points from the baseline this patient is having internal bleeding and you have to give blood and then you go repeat the hematocrit again if there is any improvement you just monitor the patient uh, as we have been monitoring uh, previously and you see if the hematocrit is repeated there is greater than 10 point drop from the baseline transfuse the whole blood and you see if there is no improvement repeat the hematocrit again if its hematocrit is still falling transfuse further blood so patient may require multiple transfusion you can go up to five uh, uh, points of blood transfusion and if there is any improvement monitor the urine output look for the signs of uh, improvement monitor the hematocrit four to six hourly and you can continue with maintenance fluid and if the patient improves you can stop the fluids after 48 hours and then in last if there is no improvement after colloids or blood transfusion consider other differential diagnosis you have given the patient uh, normal saline then you got colloid and patient has shown no signs of improvement and on the other side if the patient was having bleeding and you transfused the patient but still the patient is not responding consider other differential diagnosis for example a uh, patient may have uh, other problems for example there may be acidosis induced vasodilation which is not responding to treatment we may require inotropic support patient may have adrenal insufficiency there may be uh, hyper hypocalcemia there may be hypoglycemia there may be myocarditis so this uh, these conditions the patient may not respond to the treatment so if after fluid replacement or blood transfusion the patient is not responding consider all these alternative diagnoses for example there may be acidosis induced vasodilatation there may be development of the adrenal insufficiency there may be patient may be hypocalcemic there may be hypoglycemia and the patient may have myocarditis then get the patient's arterial blood gases acth cortisol the blood sugar the patient's cpk or ecg to see if uh, anything of this has developed then treat according to the uh, condition the patient has so this is how we manage the patients who has presented with the leaking phase of the uh, tangy fever that is if the patient shows signs of leak and there is uh, abnormal or diminished perfusion you go for a serial uh, fluid challenge if the patient responds well it's all right if give, after giving the fluid challenge patient shows a drop in hematocrit the patient has bled so in these patients we go for blood transfusions and if after blood transfusion and the fluid quota which has been uh, decided for the patient patient is given that fluid quota and the patient does not respond consider uh, other differential diagnosis and treat according to these other differential diagnosis so this is how we manage patient who present with a dengue critical illness in the uh, convalescence phase you, do, you just do not require much treatment patient starts improving uh, spontaneously and you may require giving symptomatic treatment